Okay. I'd like to call to order this work session meeting of the Boulder Valley School District Board of Education. Laura, will you call the roll? Garcia. Here. Gebhardt. Here. Nisnik. Here. Rajpal. Here. Sargent. Sweeney Moran. Here. Ziss. Here. Thank you. Dr. Anderson, I'll turn it over to you to do the introductions. Thank you, Board President Gephardt, members of the board. Good evening. Good to see you here today. Uh, we have an hour uh, this evening to talk um, about a couple of our policies uh, and give you all a little bit of depth around some instructional materials policy, and then I believe Kathleen's going to dig into several other policies, many of which that you know we were on the docket to be discussed uh, this semester. And so, with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Kathleen and Lynn Gershman, who's our Director of Academic Services. Kathleen and Lynn, take it away. Good evening, members of the board. Dr. Anderson, nice to be with you. We are going to start tonight by focusing on our instructional materials adoption policy and process. This is one of the items that was prioritized by the board during the board prioritization sessions. So uh, Lynn and I will dig in on that policy. And then we have a, I have a second presentation with a preview of some hot policy items that will be coming in the next several weeks. So starting them with the instructional materials adoption. Am I not sharing? Oh, I never hit share. So I'm sorry, I, I didn't click the actual share button, but while I get some support here, yes. This connects to the board's strategic plan, and I'll let Lynn talk a little bit about how. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, adoptions for high quality instructional materials, if done well, support challenging, engaging, and relevant instruction, customized supports, and positive and inclusive culture in the strategic plan. So the board policy that is the primary in this area is board policy IJ, instructional materials selection. It's good timing, I think, for us to talk about this policy because the board will note that there are two instructional materials adoptions on the board agenda for the regular meeting tonight. IJ was last updated by the board in 2018. I think we talked a little bit about the fact that really I think that it's reasonable to expect the board will be revisiting key policies and will be uh, eliminating some of the unnecessary or the more handbook type policies as we go. But this is really a central and important item in the board's catalog. It implements the board's statutory authority to purchase textbooks. It establishes categories for materials and corresponding criteria for those materials, including the process through which they're adopted. Different levels of usage dictate different levels of authority, with the board really being responsible for selecting and approving core instructional materials. Our policy also features other language that really is aligned with our strategic plan and our mission in that we expect that funds and purchase of these materials are going to be equitable across our schools. When we talk about the board's legal authority in this area, um, let's just revisit a couple of key statutory pieces. So the first one is, and these, as the board will recognize, Colorado Revised Statute 2232109 really is the section of statute that talks about the board's powers and duties. So you have this specific duty to determine the educational programs that will be carried on and to prescribe the textbooks for any course of instruction. So obviously the legislature hasn't updated this either to change textbook to instructional material, but that's really what we're talking about here in 2023. The other specific duty, duty is to make sure that those textbooks are available for our students including our students who have financial needs and can't afford costs associated with the use of those materials. Finally, the last power to be exercised by the board in this area is to exclude from schools and school libraries 
those materials and publications which in the judgment of the board are immoral or of a pernicious nature. I don't think I've said the word pernicious in quite a while. It's, you know, not one that you break out all the time. Um, when we look at legal authority then, I think it's important for us to think about how decisions in this area might be challenged, what that case law has looked at. And we do have federal case law. Um, as the board knows, the federal government can't directly control education. That's a power that's reserved to the states by the 10th Amendment. But when there are challenges around board decisions and selection of materials, it can result in litigation. And the primary case on this is Island Trees School District versus PICO from 1982. In this decision, the Supreme Court recognized a few things. Number one, the role of school boards in establishing curriculum and transmitting community values. They also endorsed and referenced the board's authority that we just talked about to determine the content of school libraries with the caution and the notation that board actions need to be consistent with our obligations under the First Amendment. So what does that case really tell us? Well, it really tells us a few things. And if you were at the uh, case conference this year or participated in any other professional development, a few lawyers and I um, did presentations for boards around the state. We did a webinar this year where Nathan Fall, who's in-house counsel in Greeley, really went deep into the discussion in this case. So if this only piques your interest and doesn't fully satiate you, I would encourage you to view Nathan's presentation. But a few things that we took away from that case are really the need to develop criteria, which the board has in board policy IJ. The board has 10, I believe, criteria um, expected to be used when selecting instructional materials. The criteria need to be viewpoint neutral. That's one of the hallmarks of the First Amendment. Um, we look at the materials for relevance, for appropriateness to the audience, making sure that we're addressing the needs of all of our learners, and that the board is making final decisions on, like I mentioned, these core instructional materials. The other part that I think is really significant from this case is it talks about and emphasizes the importance of using a committee or a group to make recommendations, to vet materials, and ultimately to propose to the board those uh, instructional materials that will be recommended for adoption. A committee helps us do a lot of things, but it makes us, uh, it helps us get multiple viewpoints on any particular material that we might use. And it really affords protection around that decision. That's something we see in a lot of different areas of school board law. So those are really the central elements of the legal authority. The policy itself establishes three, three categories of materials. So the first, as I've been talking about, are the core materials. So these are specifically defined in board policy IJ. When we're talking about core materials, the board's current policy requires a committee. And you'll note, I should note that this is something that is in our negotiated agreement also. It talks about curriculum coordinating councils. That isn't a currently used term for us, but the practice uh, continues. And then we'll talk a little bit more about that. So for core materials, the expectation of board policy is that there'll be a committee recommendation and that those items selected will come to the board for approval. As I mentioned, you'll see two of those on the agenda for tonight. The definition includes the scope of use of these materials, the expectation that those adopted core materials are the ones that are used across the district by our teachers when we are working on the academic, our core standards. Um, the, the policy talks a lot about the use of particular types of funds. So we noted for you there that under the current policy, core materials are eligible 
to be purchased with district funds, and then also eligible for district IT support. District-based support materials, I put a little asterisk next to this category, because this is one that's confusing for us currently in the board policy. So it references or it addresses district-based support materials and defines those as uh, instructional materials that are used to supplement and enhance instruction around core standards, academic standards. The main part of the policy delegates the authority, and this is consistent across school districts, delegates authority for selection of these materials to district staff. The current policy then has two sub-definitions. Those are what are in italics at the bottom of the slide. And those sub-definitions don't necessarily align with our main definition. And one of them then requires board approval. So in the details of this policy, we lose some of the sensibility around how the policy really needs to operate. And it also makes it harder, I think, for us to stay current, and Lynn can talk about that, when we're looking at supplemental materials or when our teachers identify, hey, I know we're between adoption cycles on, say, math, but I need a material that does X. We need our academic services to be in a position to meet those instructional needs. Um, and so we've got some recommendations that we'll talk about at the end of this presentation. The final category established under the board policy are those school-based support materials. These are items that are selected and approved by school staff. They are not core materials, and the current policy does delegate those to schools for selection and references back to the criteria that is in the board policy. So not that it's unbridled, it's just that that authority is delegated to schools to select materials that are consistent with the board policy. Uh, board of Education Policy, IJ, defines the process we developed for the most recent adoptions, the K-5 literacy and the 6-8 math adoptions. We streamlined the process with policy guidelines to do the high-level content work before the adoption, uh, before the adoption meetings, so that we could focus on material adoption based on instructional need rather than trying to do those things simultaneously. So you'll notice that we have three meetings public review, and now we're here for board approval. It, we really shortened the materials adoption part of the process by doing the curriculum work ahead of time. Thank you. Additionally, we used IJ to inform and develop a rubric for all instructional materials being considered at any time by any department or school. This rubric was built in conjunction with all departments at the Ed Center. All that needs to be added for each adoption are the content needs. The rest of the rubric should be used with fidelity. As part of the design process, we want to include these parameters to ensure an ethical and fair process. Our vendors tend to ask us if they can bring gifts for our teachers or people on the adoption committee and while everyone needs a pear-shaped stress ball, not sure that that's appropriate every time. Um, so we put these limitations in place with, with your approval. Thanks. Um, it's vital to ensure all voices are heard when adopting materials. We schedule time for district educators and staff to preview, review, and comment on potential materials to inform the finalist selection. Once we have a finalist selected, we invite all public stakeholders to review and comment on materials. We announce this opportunity with the help of BVSD Communications Department and encourage the members of the public to comment during board meetings. The following elements are further guiding details of IJ definition of district supported materials. These details will define nuances to teachers and administrators between the types of instructional materials that will be funded by district level budgets. Um, the example I'd like to use is secondary social studies. In some cases, it's been 12 years since we've had an official adoption for secondary social studies. Part of that is due to COVID, part of that is due to funding concerns, and part of that is just due to 
our um, curriculum adoption cycles as they were in the past. There's a need for core, for core materials adoption in K-12 social studies. We had to wait for the state standards revisions for social studies, so we couldn't do it this year. We sought out some supplemental materials to hold the teachers over to provide high quality instructional materials during that time. Now that the state standards have been passed, we need a year to do the curriculum work around the new standards to provide some sort of scope and sequence in the social studies um, K-12 process and our teachers will need new materials to tide them over until we get that work done. That's why we're asking for the supplemental material revisions. Thank you. The way we're looking at how to do this is to determine, uh, to determine instructional need. Um, we get this information from the roundtables that you all are a part of, that Dr. Anderson and Dr. De La Cruz hold with the different schools. We get I get a lot of that feedback about what teachers need. Um, we have data sources and we have ways to take a look at what programs we're using, what teachers are engaging with well, and what they're not using so much um, so that we know where that need is based. And um, I have discussions with teachers often. I went to every single secondary science room and every secondary social studies room this year between and during the month of November to talk to every single teacher to see what they were using that was successful and what they needed to round out their instructional materials. Um, based on that, uh, we hold vendor demos and invite teachers to go to those voluntarily. We have trials that are ongoing for teachers so that they can really examine the different materials and determine if it's something that fits their need. Um, soliciting that teacher feedback and pulling in this idea of a curriculum council. While we're not really using that idea of curriculum council because we don't have the department leads per se, um, I'm really depending on pulling in people who are passionate about their content areas to help facilitate and lead those discussions with a wide variety of teachers in those content areas. Again, we will continue to use our rubric that we developed with supplemental materials and provide this rubric to schools for when they want to purchase school-based materials. Here are a few examples of the different categories that um, we've brought to the board and some that have just been at the schools. So uh, tonight we'll be making that determination between uh, for 6-8 math materials and K-5 literacy materials. Uh, last year, around this time, we were able to purchase K-5 FOSS science kits for um, elementary science and STEM scopes for pre-K and K. In terms of support materials, um, the board approved for purchase um, Gale databases for all of our libraries and social studies classes. Um, it was just a bonus that we also got science in there. Uh, for grades five through 12, so secondary science, we purchased um, Inner Orbit, which is a program that um, helps us with science assessments and mimics the CMAS a bit. Um, and for 612, we also purchased Pivot Interactives, which was, a, which was a purchase that was approved by the board to give us some hands-on science in secondary. And we are currently in a trial phase of active classroom for social studies materials. Um, and then you can see the examples of the school-based materials that were purchased. Um, Alex Math at Broomfield High School, IXL Social Studies at Casey Middle School, and Read 180 um, for reading interventions for Monarch and Centaurus High Schools. I think this is it. So in that support materials column on this slide, we've got another board policy at work. This is board policy DJDJE that the board addressed this fall. So if there is a purchase that is over $100,000, then under our purchasing policy, those items come forward to the board for approval for purchase. A Little bit different than adoption, which again is what Lynn mentioned we'll be doing today with math and literacy. So what's next? 
So as we look at this board policy, I think there are a few things that we would propose to the board for uh, updating. And then we would love to hear any other ideas or concerns the board may have that we can address. So first, making sure that when we are looking at instructional materials, we are looking for those evidence-based materials. Also prioritizing materials that are available for our emerging bilingual students as well as our English speaking students. As we've already mentioned, clarifying the definition for and the process for district support or supplemental materials. And then some new language. Um, we do know we've had teachers this year who um, who've used materials and we've had community members raise concern about those materials to the board. That was something that we addressed this fall in particular. And it's important for our educators to understand that when they exercise their professional discretion in selecting materials consistent with the board's directive and policy, that they will be supported in their use of those materials. So adding specific language to board policy IJ to accomplish these bullet points. Uh, what was provided to the board hot off the presses that we are still working on is just an interim red line, I would call it. It reflects these initial revisions, um, but certainly this is an item that will be coming back to the board for information, for study and then adoption. So we have an opportunity now to incorporate any additional red lines or to consider any additional changes that the board may wish to suggest. And with that, we are available for your questions or discussion or input. Thank you for that, for that very thorough presentation. Um, um, I like the changes you're suggesting, and on those bullet points, I did notice that the one about prioritizing curriculum English and in Spanish has not yet made the red line. Um, and I was looking at maybe sneaking it in at bullet point number one, or where, do you have other places where you're thinking about being more explicit on having, prioritizing that curriculum. I just didn't see it in our red line. Yeah, I don't think it is in the red line. When I was actually reading that bullet point, I was thinking that that was something I needed to loop back around and do, so I hadn't done it yet. Okay. But I agree with you. I think um, criteria one would be a good place for it. Okay. And then my other question, given our um, situation with, with Fontanus and Pinnell, I wonder the benefit of being explicit about being on the CDE's approved list of instructional materials, if that's a benefit for us, if that's a detriment for us. But given um, the Fontanus and Pinnell experience we just had, and knowing the cost of our curriculum, making sure that we don't end up in situations like that again would be of interest. If, if I may, the, um, the rubric that we designed is very explicit about uh, materials have to be in English and in Spanish because of our dual language programs and they have to have the same publishing imprint. And by that I mean it can't be machine translated, it has to be um, native speaker translated or there has to be supports um, from the publisher to make sure that those are available or we won't consider it. So many times we'll get something where it's um, in color in English, but it's in black and white in the Spanish version, and it's just been machine translated, and that's not okay. Um, it has to be identical in terms of the publishing, printing, um, and digital materials. And I think that's great, because from the round tables, I feel like that's something I heard about. Sometimes the Spanish version is only available online and not in a hard copy, or for folks that are newcomers, they need math content that's in Spanish so they can still test their math skills while they're learning their English skills. So that's those things have come up, and I'm glad that the rubric handled that. The font was fine. I couldn't, but um, if it's being addressed somewhere that's not hard to overturn with future staff, or I think that I, I feel comfortable with that. And I think I would just say as the policy wonk over here on this side, that I think it's important for us to take what our staff has developed as important in the instructional rubric and make sure that its roots are in the board policy. 
So I would want to make sure that we've got good language and policy to support everything in the rubric. Richard? <clears throat> Quick question. Uh, recently, well, not recently, I mean, a couple of months ago, maybe we adopted the uh, ethnic studies at Centaurus. And I know we're having a panel here soon to talk about that. Uh, and I'm trying to remember whether there was materials in there or not. Uh, was there materials in that? Yeah, there were. I believe the board approved the course. Mm -hmm. And did they also approve materials? Yeah, in the new course description, there was a material attached to that that was part of the new course approval. I'm, I can't exactly remember the name of the book, but I can grab it when I get my computer. Thank you. I can't remember it either, but I'd like to see it at some point. Uh, where would that fall into this whole process that we're talking about in the uh, prison? So in that case, it would be because it'd be school-based, um, in that case, because it's a single school that's offering that course. So that would be the materials that they would be responsible for. Now, if that went district-wide, um, it would be a supplemental material because it's not a core course, if you will. Um, it's an elective right now for social studies. As soon as that became a graduation requirement, then it would move again to core materials. Very good. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And my hope, because apparently their hope is for it to become school wide, I mean, district wide. Lisa? Thank you. I think it's impossible to watch this presentation without thinking about some of the empty bookshelves we see in Florida. Um, folks in Texas trying to convince people that the curriculum should teach that George Washington and Thomas Jefferson never owned slaves. I wonder what else we can do um, to keep our curriculum and our kids safe from changes in our board makeup, changes in our state governance structure? Is there anything else in terms of checks and balances that we can add to these policies that will make large scale changes more difficult or more onerous? Rob had his hand up. This is an important policy, board members. I'll be, um, I'll be clear. Uh, I think that, that, that strong policy uh, defines the board's role in curriculum and provides the, the flexibility for us to be responsive to the needs of teachers, kids, and our community. Um, I think that as the policy sits, Lisa, you know, the concern would be that district-based and school-based materials could, could become under attack by a small group of individuals who maybe disagreed, right? And I think that in a, you know, big communities that can happen. I think that the piece, so I don't know that it's, it's in policy, but it is in the commitment to supporting and upholding the policy um, where, where really the strength and, and the place of safety and professionalism comes for our, our educators. Um, and so, I mean, I'll, I'll let, let Kathleen, Kathleen uh, and Lynn speak to, are there ways where you can um, further define and support these district-based and school-based support materials. You know, again, you know, worst case scenario, you'd have any material where folks would come and argue that it should be considered a core material and then put the board to notice that they should be voting or not voting and shouldn't use it until, a vote. like you could see something like that happening. And so um, the clearer we are with what those are and what those, um, you know, and, and how that authority is delegated, uh, I, I think th the better we're going to be. I mean, we talk to teachers every single day um, in our roundtables, and many of you are, are side by side with us as we do that. And, you know, I think that one of the things that our teachers genuinely appreciate is the support they feel from this board um, and from our administration around some of those decisions that they, they make that are in the best needs of kids, and when they're challenged, that they're not out on an island. And policy does that. Uh, um, so um, I don't know, Kathleen, if you want to add anything more, but I just I do think this is important, and I think it's important to do now, and um, and and uh, important to create that clarity that we can then communicate to schools and community around this is how it works in BVSD. 
Yes, I endorse obviously everything Rob said. Um, I also think that if you look, look carefully at the criteria, they really were well crafted. The first go around or over time have really become very well crafted to require that it be factual, accurate, representative. <laughs> so a lot of I think those key words, but I will tell you I think the legal protection comes from the committee process, the use of a rubric that implements our criteria, that reliance and that reference back to our educators for their recommendations under the case law. That's really, I mean, in PICO, the question was, could the board reject what the committee had recommended? And the court found that the board was improper in rejecting the committee recommendation because it was really a political decision at the board level and it was a curricular educational decision in that committee process. So that's why we've suggested at least some red lines in there to afford that protection, but I think we could enhance them to your point. Well, Thank you so much, and I do think that this is strong in so many ways, and I appreciate everything you've brought. I also think this room is going to look very different in 10 years. Few, if any of us, will still be here, and if there's anything additional we can do, I would strongly support it. Do you have any recommendations, or not yet? I'm <laughs> counting on Kathleen to be a leader. <laughs> well placed. Um, Nicole? I have one more question, because... Most people in this district don't look at this policy very often, and I was noticing um, in the outdated materials section, it says that excess materials need to be disposed of. Can you share with our community why that is a requirement of ours in this policy to dispose of excess or outdated materials? You want me to? I'm happy to. Yeah, go for it. Well, I think um, many times we've uh, marked the materials with a BVSD label or logo, and if we don't dispose of them, then it seems like we are still using them. So if it's something that we um, aren't going to be using in our classrooms and we don't want to cause a ruckus, uh, we'd like to dispose of them um, rather than just disperse them, if that makes sense. Now, if they're unlabeled, I definitely make an effort to donate um, materials that we aren't using anymore or that have gone out of adoption. Um, but I'm thinking in, in, I'm thinking of health materials. When we have outdated health materials that are clearly marked BVSD that are outdated and incorrect, we don't want those out in the public. We want those disposed of. And, and I would say it's part of how our educators know that they're operating in the way that we expect them to. We remove those materials so they aren't inadvertently used when they have, they no longer meet our criteria for use. Kitty. First of all, I apologize for being late and thank you for this presentation. And I actually on my, at home, didn't see the link to the policy hadn't scrolled down far enough, but that's not what I wanna talk about. So you talked about um, materials being supplemental, for example, the ethnic studies class at Centaurus. So if another school, say, this year decides, oh, we wanna do that next year, and they do they start looking for materials or would they just use, okay, that, that's good, that's what I was hoping. Yeah, because the, that course was proposed with a text, that text has to be used with that course because that's what you all approved. You can't use a different text for that course at this point. They would have to propose a new course with a new text for your approval, well, for, to go through the committee for approval and then it would come to you. And then that leads to another question is, if another school proposes a course that's very close but not exactly the same thing, and then a third school and a fourth school, I would think that as a district, we would want to have that somewhat standardized so you don't get different versions um, depending on where you go to school. So with that particular course, it was very important that while the, the kids at Centaurus had some 
very distinct ideas about what they wanted in that course. I spent quite a bit of time with them talking about how to make it attractive and um, palatable across the district since that was their ultimate goal. It couldn't just be about Centaurus High School kids. So we spent some time making it a tiny bit broader in some places so that it, it would be acceptable across um, all schools rather than have that exact situation. We need, we need fewer courses that are awesome than more courses that are just a little bit different. The schools know that? Okay. It's in the course catalog. And it's also in board policy IF, which we will talk about in part two of our fascinating world of policy updates. But yes, thank you. And we need to do, in my opinion, we need to do a little work on that policy. I can envision some language that says, if a school is looking at a new course or proposing a new course at the school level, that they should really look at schools who've already adopted something similar for efficiency purposes. So I have a question. Um, we approved the middle school math curriculum, and I found out that the State Department is going to be looking at math standards over the next three years. And having been through this with them before, with not a great outcome, is there anything we can do to protect ourselves? I, I mean, math seems like it shouldn't change that much, but I know we've had to scrub math curriculums in some states from anything that talks about social-emotional learning and other hot topics. <laughs> So I'm just wondering what we can do because I trust our process, I trust everything that we're doing, but I also know that when the state comes out with something that's completely different, I guess there's nothing we can do, but I'm just curious how we're trying to plan for that. Rob? Yes. Um, it's tricky, right? If we were to sit around and wait for the state to solve all of our problems, we'd never solve any of them. I mean, you know, we need to be responsive and reactive to what we need to do. So there are going to be instances where we adopt a curriculum and, and, and state board or others or a law is passed and something happens and we'll have to shift. Um, I think, you know, I think for, uh, it's, it's something they consider in our legislative priorities for, this, for, for, um, for the state board to know and understand what their role is as defined by the state constitution um, and to know and understand when they start to, you know, tinker with everybody needs to do A, B, C, D, or E, uh, there's real life implications, right? We, are, we have spent millions of dollars and we'll spend hundreds and thousands of hours training and getting folks up to speed. Um, and there's instances where it makes sense. I mean, you know, this adoption aligns with much of the work we've done. I we think we'll complement it. Um, but I think that always will be a risk. And I just think that we need to be very clear in our advocacy efforts on the unintended consequences when folks are considering weighing into areas um, that uh, it's going to cost, you know, it's going to take resources away from other things that we can do. But, I, but, I don't, but, you know, with middle school math and even elementary school math, I don't, it, it, you know, given what I've heard and, and, uh, around this, I would still continue to move forward in the ways that we are because it's the right thing to do. And every day we have um, kids, we want to make sure they have high quality materials. And uh, yeah, you can't wait. Um, in the meantime, uh, I don't feel like that that's a, um, an appropriate uh, move to make, but, but certainly concerning. And don't get me wrong, I totally think we need to move. I just am trying to figure out what kind of um, partnership we can have with the state maybe because I think our process is sound and our research is sound and so I'm hoping that um, in the future that something we can do so that we don't end up where we did with our literacy. And, and so maybe to, to Nicole's point earlier and to the point that you bring up, Kathy, maybe we can consider as part of the process some type of official reaching out to the State Department of Education on their current or future plans in regards to standardization or limiting of choices that districts could make in curriculum as part of the process uh, might make some sense. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Because like I said, I think we have outstanding people working on this. We have an outstanding process. Um, and probably not one that they can replicate at the state. So it would seem like if we could share that, right? 
that might be really helpful and maybe avoid Absolutely. some of the pitfalls in the future. And, and, and just communicate to them early on. Like, you know, how do you, how, if you're thinking about something, right, how, I, I mean, I know they do stakeholdering, but um, communicating when things are kind of um, in the queue. Uh, and, and so maybe we put that on our, our end, right, um, uh, as, as a first step to say, okay, we're thinking about doing this, this is our time frame. You know, what are the things that, that are on your agenda that you're considering at this point in time that we need to consider as we go to, through this process? That makes sense, thanks. Um, board members, any other questions before we move on? This has been outstanding, and I wish we could proof it the way Lisa talked about, but I, if there's fine tuning that you can do, Kathleen, that I'm sure we're open to all of that because I personally remember being kind of stunned that we had to like, scrub math curriculum from anything that was social emotional learning. So, yeah. Um, so I think that we have a really good process here and I'm really excited about it and thanks for bringing it forward. So next. Okay, so I was feeling really proud that I was getting better at estimating the time we'll need for discussions, but nope, nope, still off. But that's good. This is really primarily a um, coming attractions presentation. So um, on the board's list of priorities, one of our big priorities was definitely around enrollment. Oops, let me finish this curriculum piece. It does tie to what board member Sargent was asking about. Um, our curriculum development and revision policy is IF. It primarily focuses on course approval, such as the ethnic studies course that board member Garcia raised. Um, I think we need to make sure that this particular policy really aligns closely with IJ, the one we just spent our time on. It also needs some revision to be consistent with our practices as a district, which is we really need the purpose statements, why is the board taking action to be in the policy section and then details in the regulation. So um, looking at just clarifying and aligning that course approval process will be something that we're working on this year. So enrollment and assignment to school policies. Boy, do we have a catalog. We do. We have a number of policies that touch on this topic. The primary policy we'll talk about in a minute is policy JECC that deals with open enrollment, but the policies on this slide also touch on those issues. I think we have a decision to make as a board and as a district in terms of how you would like your policies to go. I certainly think that when you look at, say, let's start partway down that list, entrance age requirements, school admissions, those are very close, but not exactly the same thing. So our, the way that we reference policies by letter and these letter codes come from the National School Boards Association catalog of coding. And when we stay consistent with that coding, then it's easier for people who are trying to find something, who've looked for it in another district to find our policy and then compare it with others. I could make an argument for collapsing all of those elements into one policy. If we did not decide to do that and we stayed primarily with our current framework, I would suggest that we just need to review these without making any real significant changes to the ones listed here. Um, a few places where we'd be moving some regula regulations over into policy and vice versa and just making sure that they're clear and clean and aligned. The primary work to be done is really around open enrollment. And it's been a very exciting year in open enrollment because we have a brand new system called School Mint. And the amazing thing is that this brand new system works really well and is in fact better than our old system by all reports. So a little bit of data for the board on open enrollment. We received this year in 2023 applications for 4,653 students in the OE process. Of those applications, 1,593 students received and then accepted an offer into their first choice. 
There is a lot more data from a board RFI that is linked here on this slide to really break down what preferences were and how the individual was awarded that slot based on our criteria. So there's a lot of information to dig into there. The school mint process did several things that support the district and our families. The parent experience is significantly better in the school mint process. Parents are able to see updated status of their application in real time. They're able to make changes. They are able to complete their work within that platform so that they can accept a seat, get their kid enrolled, and move forward. It's also so much faster for our team. They had been making an old, outdated piece of software work for some time, but when they were able to adopt this new model, it's just incredibly uh, efficient when you compare it to years past. So we are looking at updating our open enrollment policies. The board uh, last acted in this area in November. JECC-R is currently our seven-page regulation. It causes me great pain that it is seven pages. So we need to get these just aligned and more efficient. We have been supported. I have been incredibly supported in the last two years, more than that, three, by our district accountability committee, which has a policy subcommittee. When DAC was last with the board, they talked about this policy and the fact that DAC is working on a literature review-based guidance memo for the board, high level, not details of red line to consider. Because DAC has worked so hard to get AE and KB ready for the board agenda tonight, they're here for you to study. DAC has not yet gotten all of their membership to weigh in and finalize that memo. So I've made some very preliminary red lines to this policy and regulation with the plan and agreement with DAC to wait for their work so that we will be coming back to the board in May, possibly June, to clean this up. But that's our plan now. What the red lines that are linked will show you, we are again, moving those policy purposes and objectives to the main policy, eliminating redundancies so that we're shortening everything up. And then one of the things that this board has talked about over several years, really also as part of our charter contract review, is getting our charter school criteria embedded in our contracts so that they aren't negotiated or looked at every single year and eliminating those preferences that the literature would associate with privilege. So those are items like alumni preferences, uh, preferences for kids who are related to those who founded the school that last in perpetuity, um, preferences, heightened preferences for students who have applied in prior years and not been admitted. So some of those criteria continue to exist in this red line in the charter school regulations. But so far what we have is really just directed at these first couple of bullet points, the purpose of the revisions. Um, and that's what I've linked for you. So uh, Chris Haynes is the chair of our DAC policy subcommittee. He's here today in, um, in the, is it called an audience? I guess it is. So he's here with us today, making sure that we, uh, he's up to speed on all the things that we're talking about. And we'll look forward to Dak's input on that item. Also coming, Title IX, um, we've got a couple of things. The first one is easy for this district. So just this week, the federal government came out with a proposed regulation around transgender athlete participation. Fortunately, in Colorado, since 2008, we've had protections in our state law. I don't think this is going to be relevant to us. What it would uh, permit are thoughtful school policies about how kids participate in activities consistent with their gender identity, which is a right under Colorado law. 
and it prohibits the one-size-fits-all policies that you've probably heard about in the news. So I believe we're already compliant. I think it'll be an important topic um, in across the country in education. Uh, but for us, I think it will not require any policy revisions at this point. We do think we are going to see policy changes to the investigation process around Title IX complaints, sexual harassment complaints. This board has heard me talk before about the fact that currently the Title IX regs are written for kindergarten through higher education. And some of those protections that feel important at higher education, like the ability to confront witnesses, really doesn't work well in a K-12 uh, system. So uh, we hope that we are going to get some updated regulations that are going to lift some of the requirements that right now are pretty burdensome for us when you think about what that investigation process looks like. So if that does come to pass in a timely fashion, the board can expect revisions to be proposed for board policy AC-R2. That's our Title IX sexual harassment investigation policy and JBB, which defines sexual harassment. We also have been working on with our uh, athletic director for the district, Terry Waterman, and our athletic review committee updates to our athletic policies. The board will recall, or many of you around the board will recall in 2020, we updated IGDJA and the associated regulation and exhibit. This was our athletic code of conduct. We had students who came forward to us in 2019 who said that they didn't think that that athletic code aligned with current best practice. So we did that work in 2020. And what that really looks like is making sure that even if students are in an interscholastic or an athletic activity, if there's an allegation of misconduct, that's going to be investigated and addressed by the school, not by a coach who may not be a school district staff member. So we made those changes in 2020. Next up, we have IGDE, which has not been addressed since 1995. We have IGDG, Student Activity Funds Management, that has not been updated since the manual was adopted. And we have IGDJ, which has not been updated since 1978. So the board can look forward to those items coming. And a lot of that relates to the Title IX equity in participation in athletics and activities. Um, the board knows that following the successful ballot issue this fall, that we will be looking at free meals for students. So we will have to update our meals and our free and reduced lunch meal benefit policies. And finally, it is that season where we get to talk about retirement for some of our educators who have spent their career working on behalf of BVSD kids. And I'm going to join in, not with my own retirement quite yet, but with a wholesale retirement of board policies. I pulled out a couple of my favorites for you tonight. EDBA and EDBA-R are from the 70s and they talk about how we manage materials. They are unnecessary. We don't need a board policy. We need a board direction on how we'll adopt materials, but your staff can figure out how to maintain those materials without a board policy. And similar components like bomb threats. We see school safety as a much broader topic these days than just a simple bomb threat. Simple bomb threat, not like that's the good old days. That sounded that way a little bit, but um, this policy is incredibly specific and outdated and unnecessary. So my personal objective is to have at least 10 on every board agenda between now and the end of the year that we are targeting for retirement. I think I told Chris Haynes, I'd like to lose 20 pounds this summer and about 100 policies. So that's what we're going to aim for for this season. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Board members, questions? 
I just have a quick question. So on the Title IX, my understanding is that there's latitude for a district to enact some kinds of different policies around transgender for older, more competitive sports. You don't think we need to address that? I would like to look at it more closely before I say I don't think we need to address it. But um, I think that the purpose of our school activities is to promote wellness and good habits and to keep our kids engaged with school. It really isn't heading to the Olympics straight out of our programs probably. <laughs> So I don't know, but I would definitely want to look at that and collect some feedback from people like our athletic review committee and our staff members and community members who would like to speak to that issue before I make a recommendation. Thanks. Nicole? Thank you for that overview. Um, I will be brief. So a couple things that came to mind with the JECCR policies that I've been thinking about that were not on the short list. I don't know if something DAC is considering and the link asked me for permission, which I haven't, so I haven't seen it yet. Um, but, you know, it talks about benefits eligible employees getting preferential treatment in our enrollment process. You have to work at least half time. Is that appropriate? Is it helpful to recruit employees if we can bring that down to say anybody that works for us might be able to have a preference in open enrollment? question worth I'm pondering. Um, another question I have, is there are a lot of vestiges from our de-stratification plan in this policy and some neighborhood carve-outs that my assumption was a long time ago were higher poverty areas, like around BCSIS and High Peaks and different places. Are those still relevant to us? Is that something worth looking into? Um, and are they serving uh, us and our populations and our other neighborhood schools well? Seems like our definition of focus schools is a little bit out of date there. Um, so cleaning some of that up. And then, you know, I've been thinking about folks that have been moving and being a little bit more transient with rent. We have gone back and forth as a district on grandfathering in students to schools. Um, and I feel like our f current policy, if you move, you have to reopen enroll um, into the school in which you pre were previously in. Open enrollment's getting easier with declining enrollment, but I wonder if that's a best service for continuity and educational experiences for our students, and if that's something that we can look into a little bit as well. Board members, anything else? We're looking forward to losing 100 policies. Thank you. That's a lot of work. Um, so board members, what would you like to do? It's um, 6 o'clock, and we have an audience. Um, are we okay with rolling right into the board meeting or do we need a break? What is the desire of the board? I'm just looking to see what you all want to do. So maybe we take a break after we go through public comment and hear all of, um, kind of so we respect people who have come and expect us to start on time. Is that all right with everyone? Board President, I need to move the tables and change the Google Meet invite. All right, so we need a break. Thank you, Laura. Sorry, we will be quick. Five minutes, Laura, does that work? Okay, we're in recess for five minutes. <laughs>